Hi everyone, welcome back to Extra Credit, and today is our 14th episode on Ancient Rome. So last time we saw that in the year 68 AD, the suicide of the Emperor Nero left Rome with a brand new emperor named Vespasian. Vespasian's rise to power is a pretty big deal for Roman history because he is the first ever emperor to rule without having royal blood, meaning that he's not related to Julius Caesar or Caesar Augustus. So in honor of this break in the royal family, today we're going to take a break from our main storyline so far and use today's episode to have a look at what a day in the life would have looked like in the city of Rome itself. Now I know it's probably pretty hard to put yourself back in time mentally and transport yourself to a major thriving city thousands of years ago in the ancient world, but if you want to get a good sense of the flavor of what it would have been like, just go stick your head in the nearest outhouse and inhale deeply, because that pretty much captures it. So what would daily life have been like for the average Roman in the first century AD in what would have been the world's largest city at that time, swarming with somewhere close to a million people? Well, that's pretty much an impossible question to answer, simply because there was no such thing as the average Roman. After all, daily life would look completely different if you woke up in the mansion of a senator versus the apartment of a butcher, or if you were the slave of the senator, or the wife or daughter of the butcher. So if you want to get a sense of the nitty-gritty details of the ins and outs of life for different kinds of people, I can't really do that here for you today, but I highly recommend that you read this fantastic little book called 24 Hours in Ancient Rome by Philip Matizak, because he can answer way more of your questions about this stuff than I can. But what I can do for you today is take you on a whirlwind tour of the city of Rome itself, so we can see the types of things that these people would have encountered on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, outhouse jokes aside, the first thing that you probably would notice about Rome really would be the smell. And it's not because the Romans were particularly dirty, in fact, they weren't. It's just that any time you pack a million people into 16 square miles without modern plumbing, there's gonna be a certain odor. Even the Romans themselves acknowledged this with my personal favorite Roman of all time, the vain but intensely patriotic politician Cicero, famously referring to Rome as the cesspool of Romulus. And cesspool literally means sewage pit, so I'm not exaggerating. That being said, the city of Rome was actually way ahead of its time when it came to sanitation and waste management. This is in part due to the fact that the city had a massive sewer system called the Cloaca Maxima, which still exists today, as well as several enormous aqueducts that kept it supplied with fresh running water. So Rome was actually a whole lot cleaner than most cities of its time, but that's still kind of like saying, hey, welcome to Manitoba, at least we're warmer than Siberia. On this note, as you walk through Rome, you would also notice several large buildings dedicated to another aspect of cleanliness, public baths. With personal hygiene being such a challenge in the ancient world, going to the bathhouse was part of the daily routine of any self-respecting Roman. In addition to getting clean, bathhouses were also a place to relax, socialize, and get a good old-fashioned olive oil scrape down from a nearby slave. But the main event was definitely the water itself, with many bathhouses having three different pools of varying temperatures called the Frigidarium, the Caladarium, and the Tepidarium, which naturally give us our English words for frigid, scalding, and the approximate temperature of your a and fries after they've sat in the car for half an hour on your way home from the drive-thru. Now, in our own society today, most people would probably rather lick sea urchins than take a bath in public, so we have to ask ourselves, why didn't the Romans do this in the privacy of their own, you know, bathrooms? Well, the simple answer is that most Romans were too poor to afford a house that had anything close to what we would call a bathroom. Many of the city's poor lived in rickety, high-rise apartment buildings that had the unfortunate habit of A, burning down, B, collapsing, or C, collapsing while burning down. So many great options. So to take care of their bodily needs, most Romans used public toilets that became widely available around the time of Julius Caesar. Fun fact, our current Emperor Vespasian actually had the brilliant idea to put a tax on these public toilets as a way of making more money. And when his son Titus pointed out that this was kind of a gross way to make cash, Vespasian responded with the famous Latin wisecrack, pecunia non olet, meaning money does not smell and thus the dad joke was born. 
However, not all Romans had to put up with the indignity of paying to use a public bathroom. If we take a short walk to the heart of the city, we'll find ourselves on the doorstep of Rome's swankiest neighborhood, the Palatine Hill. Now, the fact that our English word palace comes from Palatine gives you an idea of what types of houses you would find here. This is definitely where Jeff Bezos would have lived. And just a stone's throw from the Palatine lay the downtown heart of Roman city life, the Forum, a collection of massive open spaces, temples, law courts, markets, and other public buildings, where you could rub shoulders with anybody from a senator giving a speech to a massive crowd, to slaves running errands for their household masters. Speaking of slaves, the city was absolutely bursting with them. It's estimated that they made up about 30% of the population and performed a huge number of essential services, from construction, engineering, and government work, all the way to household and domestic labor. Slaves could even buy their own freedom if they earned enough cash, and they usually didn't give their masters too much trouble, except for that one awkward time with Spartacus. And speaking of Spartacus, let's get ready for our final stop on this whirlwind tour of Rome with a visit to the city's crown jewel dominating the Roman skyline, the Colosseum. You'll remember that the Colosseum is currently being built by Vespasian, using the slaves and cash that he and his son Titus had earned from their success in the Jewish War. And very much like the pyramids of Egypt, the Colosseum is pretty much the first thing that comes to mind when we think about Rome nowadays. This is because it symbolizes pretty much everything that we find most important about Rome. Namely, it was huge, long-lasting, and very, very bloody. To get into the details, the Colosseum was a massive arena that could hold about 45,000 people, which, if you're from Manitoba, that's like three MTS centers only with sand instead of ice. And also like the MTS Center, it came equipped with public drinking fountains and public bathrooms where the women's line was about 18 times longer than the men's. But the Colosseum wasn't just for any old sports, it was for blood sports, meaning games that involved injury and death. A typical day's festivities might begin in the morning with a display involving the showcase of various wild and exotic animals from around Rome's empire. And by showcase, I mean slaughter, because nothing shows how tough you are like killing a bunch of defenseless giraffes. Okay, I mean, giraffes have vicious ninja kicks, but still. Then around noon, there'd be the public execution of prisoners and other criminals, followed in the afternoon by the day's main event, the gladiators. Gladiators were professionally trained fighters who came in a variety of shapes and sizes. So for example, there was the Mermillo, who fought with heavy armor and a straight sword, and the Retiarius, who fought with a net and a trident like a fisherman. And a few other types as well. Contrary to popular belief, not all gladiator matches ended in death. After all, they spent so much time and effort training these guys that you didn't just want to chew through them all at once. That said, sometimes the slaughter was truly on a massive scale, with Vespasian's son Titus one time holding a series of games that took place over 123 straight days and involving thousands of deaths. With carnage on this scale, it's not surprising that as Christianity gained influence around the empire, gladiator matches were eventually banned by the emperors around the 400s AD. Which makes perfect sense because naturally nowadays we're completely repulsed by the idea of killing being used as a form of entertainment. So that's a day in the life of the city of Rome, and if you ask me, between the slavery, the slaughter, and the smell, I'll take modern day Manitoba any day of the week. But seriously, the winters, I mean really. Hey everyone, thanks for watching Extra Credit. It was fun to make today's episode and take a bit of a break from the main storyline, which we'll get back to next time. Your challenge for this week is to research the naval battles. And yes, you heard that right, the naval battles that took place in the Colosseum sometimes and see how on earth they managed to pull this off. As always, stay safe, have fun, read a book, and we'll see you next time.